Hi, I'm Brian Russell, and I want to give a brief inter introductory lecture to how to read the Gospel of Matthew from a missional perspective. Because in this class, as we move through different parts of Matthew's Gospel, it's critical to learn to read it from the perspective of, of mission. Uh, those of you who know me from my other classes or from some of the writing that I've done in, in books and also various places on the web know that uh, a missional hermeneutic is essentially what my approach is to the Bible. And the key question I want to ask is, is this, uh, what does the biblical text say about mission and how can it inform our 21st century missional practice? Now, sometimes students will object and say that we're imposing some kind of ideological grid on a text. You know, is a, is a missional hermeneutic something that comes out of the text, or are we imposing it on a text? Now, my argument is pretty simple. My, my argument is that mission actually arises out of a close reading of the text. And in fact, we're going to misread many parts of the Bible if we forget that the biblical story itself from Genesis all the way to Revelation is telling the big narrative of God's mission on how God wants to make God's self known and in, in anticipation of, of the new creation. Now, that's a whole bigger story, the big picture of the text. But mission comes out of the Bible, and it starts from the very beginning of Genesis and moves all the way into the New Testament. So it's also not just a New Testament phenomenon. Now, the imposition of a missional hermeneutic, again, isn't foreign to the text. And it's also true of Matthew's Gospel, because Matthew's Gospel, Matthew is writing to a church in order to help them articulate what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in their context and essentially folk function as light. Now, I have some representative passages here that I want you to ponder a little bit as we think about Matthew. Again, this isn't everything, but this is just a little taste that can show you how mission is actually central to what Matthew's Gospel is about. Now, most of us would recognize that Matthew's Gospel is about making disciples. Here's the piece that when we study Matthew carefully, we want to add to that. Because what does it mean to be a disciple? It's disciples are in the reduplication business. So Jesus makes disciples so that those disciples can make more disciples. And an easy no-brainer place to see that is in the Great Commission passage, passage where post-resurrection, the risen Christ appears to the eleven, again, Judas is gone, in Galilee, and calls them to this new vocation of making disciples by engaging the world, baptizing persons in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them the way of Jesus, the things that Jesus has taught. So it's easy to start there that Jesus sends out his disciples as ambassadors at the end, but what's critical is to see that this isn't a new add-on to the story. This is central and really the climax of what's already been taking place in the entire Gospel of Matthew. And we can see that as early just in the way that Jesus' ministry goes. Jesus' public ministry in Matthew begins at 417. He is baptized by John in chapter 3. But immediately in 417, Jesus is going to call disciples. I'll say more about that in a minute. But central to calling disciples is, um, follow me, come after me, and I will make you fishers of people. So mission is integral to what it means to be a disciple from the very beginning of Matthew's gospel. But it's even better than that. So we can back up to the very, very start of Matthew. And Matthew's gospel begins in an interesting way, at least from a modern perspective, it begins with a genealogy. We find out from verse 1 who Jesus is. Jesus is the Christ, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. And the entire genealogy is 
structured around those three titles, Christ or Messiah, Son of David, and Son of Abraham. The important part for missional perspective is this title of Son of Abraham. Abraham is mentioned in two other places, clearly in Matthew's Gospel. In chapter 3, John talks about God can ra uh, raise up um, children of Abraham. So it's kind of a missional figure that, that when John is talking to the religious leaders, uh, he's talk, he, he, he mentions the possibility of, uh, of, of, of God being able to raise up um, other sons and daughters, right? And then another place is in chapter 8, Jesus said he's never seen such faith. This is the place where Jesus heals a centurion's servant, and he talks about um, the, uh, the, a great faith and alludes back to Abraham. So seeing Jesus as a son of Abraham is a link back to God's mission, which begins with the call of Abraham in the Old Testament. Remember, in, in, in Genesis 12, 3, this is one of the most important verses in the Old Testament, God had called Abraham and said, uh, through you, all families on the earth will be blessed. And so back in the context of the Old Testament, Genesis 1 to 11, it had all the nations in view. Then God calls a particular people. He calls Abraham. And it's at that point, Jesus, God tells Abraham, I'm calling you for the sake of all of the families that we just talked about in Genesis 1 to 11. So Jesus comes as the fulfillment of that, as being as the means uh, by which God is going to bless all families on the earth. Paul alludes to this in his letters when he's looking back to Abraham as well. Now, also along with that, right um, um, early in the gospel, right before Jesus calls disciples in, in Matthew chapter 4, 12 to 16, when, right before Jesus begins his public ministry, there's another reference to the wider world. Uh, and in when um, Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 9 and explicitly follows the translation that calls Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. That's significant. Where does Jesus give the Great Commission at? Galilee. So the term Galilee in Matthew's Gospel is um, essentially the sphere of eschatological expectation. And part of that expectation for the end times is that all the world is going to be reached. And so we, we just see that part and parcel to the Gospel of Matthew. So that reference to Galilee of the Gentiles in chapter 4 also supports this idea of Jesus being the fulfillment of the son of Abraham. Now, how does this mission take place? And this is always a question. When you're on mission, what kind of mission does, does Matthew model? And we get the hints of this early on. In chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, this is the story of the Magi, or the, the wise guys, or traditionally the wise men. But these are Magi. These are essentially astrologers who have some insight into a star and leave their their land somewhere far to the east of Israel and travel to Palestine to inquire about where is the, born the king of the Jews. Now, what's fascinating about this is there's a contrast within this section between Herod and all Jerusalem, which include the scribes and the, the people that, that knew the scriptures, and the Magi. All the Magi have is insight into a star, yet they perceive something that the insiders don't perceive. The insiders, Herod and all the Jerusalem with Herod, are threatened by this announcement of the king of the Jews. The Magi, these are foreigners, these are outsiders, they're open to the message of Jesus. And so we're going to see that as a theme in Matthew's gospel. Insiders often are the impediments to the mission, whereas the outsiders are the ones hungry and open to the new things that God is doing. And I don't want to give too much away at this point, but we're going to watch for that theme. Who's an insider? Who's an outsider? 
who would you expect to respond positively to Jesus over against who actually does respond positively to Jesus? And how might that inform us in our missional practices today? Well, then, once Jesus actually begins his public ministry at 417 by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus announces that in his person, the long-awaited era of salvation has indeed come. And what Jesus does then is, I mean, how do you respond to the kingdom? He says we're going to realign or we're going to repent. But the first action that Jesus does after announcing the kingdom is Jesus calls to himself a group of disciples. And in 4, 18 to 22, Jesus calls two sets of two brothers to become essentially the, you might call it the tip of the spear for this missional community that Jesus is going to call, nurture, and then send out at the end of the gospel. And so what happens? Jesus calls his disciples to himself to be part of the mission, and he calls them, as I mentioned previously, to come after him, and he's going to make them fish for people. So we have a principle, again, that the instant someone's called to follow Jesus, that is becomes a commission to mission. One of the things I like to say, I've got this from my friend, and he's a church planner, Alex McManus, is this, the gospel comes to us on its way to someone else. The gospel comes to us on its way to someplace else. And that's critical to see that right from the beginning of the calling of disciples, Jesus leads his disciples into the world on mission. And the kind of mission that Jesus models Uh, Chapters 5 to 7 is the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus gives an ethic for his disciples to live out the kingdom values. But then Jesus models what does ministry look like in action. And in word and deed, Jesus demonstrates that the kingdom has in fact come. And just to give an illustration, these are boundary-breaking acts that Jesus does. It's interesting to see who are the recipients of Jesus' miracles and the teaching. And just to take the first three miracles... Um, in in uh, the opening three paragraphs of chapter 8, Jesus heals a leper, in other words, a person who is ritually unclean. And he demonstrates, he even touches the person that, uh, that the power of the kingdom is greater than even anything that can make you unclean. So he breaks boundaries there. Secondly, Jesus heals the servant of a Roman centurion. Now again, the Romans were oppressors. They were occupiers of of the the Jewish homeland, yet Jesus heals the oppressor's servant. Again, breaking down boundaries and flipping expectations over who should be a represent, uh, who should be a recipient of the miraculous. Then the last um, healing that takes place in these opening three paragraphs is Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Now, again, I can make a bad joke and say, see, there's even hope for mother-in-laws, but really what the point is, Jesus is also healing women. So these are groups that would have been on the margins, uh, unclean persons, uh, foreigners, especially foreign oppressors, and then women. And as we see in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is going to interact with these persons in ways that breaks down boundaries and demonstrates that the kingdom is, in fact, um, for the whole world. And again, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the biggest impediment to the kingdom's flourishing is actually the religious people. And that, believe it, that's actually a pretty, pretty powerful word for us to ponder today. Well, after Jesus models ministry, what does Jesus actually do? And this is one of the major teaching sections in the gospel. Jesus calls his disciples to himself, and then he sends them out with instructions how, on how to essentially replicate the mission that Jesus has modeled and take that into the world. So again, when Jesus is modeling ministry, he's going into the world on mission. And when Jesus sends out the disciples, he's sending his disciples into the world on mission to do the same sorts of things that he did. Um, And then the last piece, again, we can say a lot more, is notice Jesus's trademark method of calling persons to himself. Jesus doesn't say, believe in me, in Matthew's gospel. Again, we're not denying that the, of the role of faith, because that's it's more implicit, as we'll see as we go through the, uh, the work this semester. But the language that Jesus uses is quite dynamic. He says, follow me. 
again, so a disciple is following the master, and where is Jesus calling his disciples to follow him? It, it, it's pretty simple. Jesus is um, leading them into mission. That goes back to the Great Commission, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Matthew 16, 24, great pat text. Whoever would come after me, let him or her deny self, take up the cross, and follow me. So part and parcel to being a disciple of Jesus is a, a radical realignment of our lives as we follow Jesus into the world on mission. And that's the model for today. And the risen Christ continues to go with us, as Matthew 28, 20 says. Again, that's a little taste of the missional heartbeat, if you will, of Matthew's gospel. And so we'll continue to look for insights uh, throughout our reading of the book. If you have any initial questions about Matthew's gospel, uh, let me know. Again, I'm Brian Russell. It's my privilege to serve as your professor.